on holiday near Dartmoor, cheerfully suggested that when or if I ever recovered from the terrible polio, I might think about joining his family firm, the Educational Supply Association. As I was only too glad to have a chance to get on with life and earn some money, I gratefully agreed. The ESA was a very popular outfit, supplying schools all over the country with all the things schools need. Desks, blackboards, chalk, everything. They decided that I should work in each of their various departments in turn. At their own furniture factory in Stevenage, I started working on the machines, battling away with lathes and screwdrivers. I remember the peculiar and lovely smell of timber. I moved on to selling, driving around the absolute plus areas of Sussex and Kent in my small rover. I enjoyed this. There is a lot of similarity between selling and acting, and I was happy. Through the Stevenage Andrams, I became great friends with a local family called Grosvenor. The father was the GP in Stevenage. He was very old-fashioned. He didn't have a stethoscope, but used a trumpet. He lived with his daughter Dorothy, an exceptionally plain girl, with a strange trick of blowing her hair out of her eyes all the time. She was an extremely kind woman, and everyone adored her. She was very keen on the Andrams, always playing everybody's mother. Her handsome brother, Chetwind Grosvenor, also a doctor, was adored by all the ladies in the district, but he had no time for Andrams. He went hunting, fishing and shooting, country pursuits that in those days you could follow in Stevenage. We used to go fishing together. I did two plays with them, one as Lieutenant Raleigh in Journey's End, and the other an old-fashioned play, Diplomacy. In the summer, I joined an out-of-door company and played Shakespeare on the lawns of country houses. I played Orlando in As You Like It, thought myself very dashing. Playing opposite me in Love's Labour's Lost, the part of Don Amado, a part I played at Stratford years later, was a man called Osmond Daltrey, who later put his money into theatrical management. He was to offer me my first professional job and introduce me to yet another very important man in my life, Patrick Ide. I had also joined an amateur dramatic society in London, the St Pancras People's Theatre. It was based in an old, deconsecrated Wesleyan chapel in St Pancras and was a very superior amateur old vic run by a splendid lady called Edith Neville who was a friend of Lillian Bayliss and who made us work very hard and properly, almost as one would in a professional repertory season. I took this very seriously. I would be selling exercise books in Ramsgate or Margate, look at my watch and think, Oh, God, I've got rehearsal at half past six, let in my clutch and come screaming back to London. It was obvious after some time that this could not go on. I had been with the firm about five years and was being groomed for stardom. I was about to go into the offices and maybe become a director. But I was spending so much time on my theatricals with the Andrams that I really thought I must come clean with Johnny Appleton's father, who had been so kind to me. Did I intend to become a professional actor, he asked. I thought for a moment and said, Yes, I suppose I do. Typically, he couldn't have been more helpful. He was very complimentary about my efforts over the last five years and said I could stay with the firm until I found a job in the theatre. When I finally decided to leave the ESA, I took my replacement around my patch of Sussex and Kent and introduced him to the vagaries of selling exercise books. Then off I went in search of my first professional theatrical job. By this time, I had a little room above a snack bar in Porchester Place by Marble Arch. I ate in the snack bar, which was run by a lovely ex-army man. Any free time I had had between selling school exercise books and the Andrams was spent in the company of the Partridges, three beautiful girls, Joan, Betty and Bobby, who lived in Hampstead. We used to go dancing together. I was still very much involved in the St Pancras People's Theatre, and it was partly this company that made me make up my mind to throw in my lot and become an actor. 
My first theatrical engagement after leaving the ESA was as understudy to Bernard Lee and assistant stage manager at the Savoy Theatre in a play called Night Sky by L. Dugard Peach. This was January 1937, and my salary was two pounds ten shillings per week. The play was about the next war, which we didn't take very seriously, but L. Dugard Peach did. It was full of searchlights and brave pilots, and was fairly prophetic, but I suppose it wasn't very entertaining, as it only ran for ten performances. People didn't want to know about war, and it was not a subject which drew them into the Savoy. Osmond Daltrey, whom I had met during Amdram days at Stevenage, had got together with a rich, stage-struck Australian lady who had put her money into theatrical management. They were running a company called Westminster Productions. She offered me my first decent role in a professional company. This was playing Lodovico in Othello at the People's Palace Theatre, Mile End Road, in 1937. Stephen Murray played Othello, and later I was paid one pound a week extra to understudy him, in addition to understudying the Duke of Venice. Another moving spirit behind this artistic venture, Pat Eyde, was a lovely man who, alas, is no more, and I am eternally grateful to Osmond Daltrey for introducing me to him. He was a great inspiration, full of help, encouragement, and wit. When the one-week run of Othello was over, he invited me to audition for a tour he was arranging, taking three English plays to the main cities of Scandinavia and the Baltic. It was the only audition in which I have been successful, and I secured the parts of Henry in Outward Bound and Sergius in Arms and the Man. My professional acting career had begun. The tour was great fun, and I adored it. We were a very happy company, the plays went well, and, as we each had one play out, we were able to combine pleasure with business and have a good look around the places we visited. I thought, this is for me. But after the glories of Scandinavia, I eventually found myself in London with no work. However, the management of the Savoy were about to present Ninety Sail, a play about Christopher Wren and the English Navy. As it was simply crammed with parts, I was assured of work in three weeks' time when rehearsals were to begin. So I counted the money I had in the bank, which came to thirty pounds, and went to Poland, chasing a lady. Wanda Zielinska was a beautiful Polish girl I had met at a dance in England a year or two previously. We got to know each other very well. We never became lovers, although I was very attracted to her and she to me. She was great fun and danced beautifully. So did I in those days, when you held your partner and didn't jiggle about with your fists in the air. I took off for Warsaw with a third-class railway ticket and booked into the Europejski Hotel. It was the time of a religious festival in Poland with much feasting and dancing. Wanda and I danced every night, somewhere or other. Warsaw was full of Polish army officers in their uniforms, and there was much gold braid and clicking heels. There were all sorts of dances which I didn't know, but soon learned. It was great fun. We were driven about in droskies in the snow, romantically holding hands under the fur rugs. Then we went back to bed. She to her parents' flat, overlooking the vistula, and I to my hotel. It was all very proper. Not long after this, those glorious Polish officers were to be massacred at Katyn. Wanda was in England when the war broke out, and her parents telegraphed her to come back home immediately. She went straight home into the thick of it. I had had this marvellous fortnight in Warsaw, spent all my money, and had a few zotties left, which I was under the mistaken impression were worth about nine or ten pounds. I had got the exchange rate muddled, and in fact had about ten pence to see me through this long third-class journey back to England, with a five-hour wait in Berlin. 
I was carrying with me a pineapple and a huge box of beautiful chocolates as a present from my Polish hosts to friends in London. By the end of the journey, both the chocolates and the pineapple had been consumed. But I was feeling quite cheerful with the prospect of almost immediate employment. However, when I reported to the Savoy Theatre, I discovered that the play had been cancelled. So there I was, in my digs at Marble Arch, without a penny in the world, having sold my soul to the devil, as it were. I often wonder how I existed. Perhaps kind Mr. Thorsby, the snack bar man, took pity on me and gave me credit. Anyway, Patrick Ide came to my rescue again and introduced me to his great friend, Ronald Russell, who ran a weekly repertory company, the Rapier Players, at the Colston Hall, Bristol. I went to Bristol, was interviewed by Ronald Russell, and got the job. It was he who was to turn me into a professional actor. So it was I found myself a member of the Rapier Players in Bristol, being paid five pounds a week. I started the 1937 season playing a character called Uncle Henry, in the play the title of which escapes me, feeling very disappointed at having to play an old uncle. Thereafter, I played old uncles and faithful retainers for weeks and weeks. Having recently seen Gerald de Maurier at Wyndham's Theatre in London and much admired him and his stylish way with the silver cigarette case, I was convinced that there was a leading man in me wanting to get out. But I was not allowed, for what seemed like a lifetime, to play the leading man. And quite right, too. On the first day of rehearsal, I was to meet the two juvenile actresses. One was a very pretty blonde, Margaret Fry, and the other a lovely brunette, Eve Mortimer, who, years later, was to become my wife. In weekly rep, you had to provide all your own modern clothes. We were given a great list of things that were considered absolutely essential. Men had to find a blazer, grey flannels, a lounge suit, dinner jacket, and, I think, tails. The girls had to have, amongst other things, a cocktail dress and something called matching accessories. It was much more difficult for them, as they couldn't be seen in the same outfit twice. So much ingenuity was called for, and there was a great deal of borrowing and running things up on sewing machines. Some actresses became so adept at this that patrons often used to come to the theatre each week as much as anything to see the actress's latest outfit. Oh, the great relief, when we were doing a costume play and the hamper would come down from Berman's or Morris Angel's. There would be an unseemly scuffle to get the best costume and find the right wig. Rehearsals were very perfectly timed. You were allowed two minutes a page. So, if you didn't come in until page 20, you knew exactly what time to arrive at rehearsal. Time was at a premium in weekly rep. There was no time for analysis or any deep psychological investigation into a part. It really was a question, as Noel Coward said, of learn the lines and don't bump into the furniture. It certainly meant you had no time to worry whether something was right. You just had to do it and see. At the end of our first season in Bristol... Eve and I set off for a holiday in Scotland in an old Riley 9 that I was buying for £60 on higher purchase. The car wasn't going very well. I didn't know anything about cars then, and I still don't. All I can do is open the bonnet and cry. I just hoped it would cheer up. And to our astonishment, it did. We camped or stayed in little pubs and had a wonderful holiday. I tried to teach Eve to fish. It was rather like teaching your nearest and dearest to drive. In other words, hopeless. She did a little, just to keep me company, but it never really grabbed her. I had a part in a radio play back in Bristol. I had to be there before the beginning of the theatre season. Dropping Eve off at Liverpool to see her family, I drove south to keep my appointment with the BBC. I had an almighty smash en route, very nearly killing the lady driver in the other car. Fortunately, the lady eventually made a full recovery, but that was the end of my car. I had only paid one instalment. There were eleven more to go, 
and the Riley was a total write-off. So it was that I turned up at the BBC to do my first radio play carrying a sack full of fishing tackle and a primus stove. The play was Quinny's, starring Henry Ainley, a great actor who, sadly, was by then past his best. I was happily placed as my father had sold Jordan Manor and bought a house in Holt, a little village not far from Bristol. So I dossed down there for the rest of the summer break. I wasn't destitute. Then back to my digs with the Miss M's for the beginning of my second Bristol season, which opened with Stella Gibbons's Cold Comfort Farm. Cold Comfort Farm horrified Bristol audiences, who imagined they would be in for an evening of pastoral idyll. Instead, they were treated to a complete send-up of all pastoral idylls, and they left in droves. We all adored it as a company. It was enormous fun to play all those outrageous parts. I played Seth, whose shirt buttons were always undone. Mrs. Starkadder was played by a well-known radio actress, Mabel Constant Duras, who had adapted the book. In the summer of 1939, Eve and I both left Bristol after two very happy years. Eve joined the White Rose Players in Harrogate, and I was fancy-free. I was staying with my friends the Dyballs in Hertfordshire when war broke out. Everything stopped. The theatres closed, and we all expected to be bombed at any moment. I was very much in love with Eve, and my first thought was to get up to Harrogate to be with her. We decided we would go back to Bristol to die with our friends. I remember when we were catching the train from Leeds, seeing a young soldier in tears, saying goodbye to his girlfriend at the station. In fear and trembling, we took the train to Bristol, expecting to be bombed every time the train stopped. We thought, this must be it. It was the phony war. The first bombs were not to fall for six months. As there was no work in Bristol, I volunteered for heavy rescue in the ARP, Air Raid Precautions. This meant standing by to leap at a moment's notice into the heavy rescue wagons and go to dig people out of bombed buildings. As there were no bombs, there was no digging to be done. In fact, nothing to be done at all. This didn't seem to me to be a very good way to fight the war, so I volunteered for the Navy. I decided on the Navy as I had painful memories of Army cadet days at school. I couldn't bear the thought of scratchy, khaki uniform and seeing the whites of the enemy's eyes. I wasn't very brave, and I preferred the look of those bell-bottom trousers. Their lordships, not having much immediate need for my services, suggested I go back and follow my chosen profession, or whatever that might be, and they would let me know if they needed me. The theatres were starting to open again and not much wanting to go back into heavy rescue, I answered with Eve an advertisement in the stage for actors to audition for a new repertory company being formed in the assembly room's bath. We were to be interviewed by one Evelyn Perkis, who gave us to understand that we would be amazed by the names who had answered her advertisement. Intimidated by this news, we naturally didn't expect even small parts in a company where such famous actors were queuing up to work with Evelyn Perkis. To our great joy and delight, however, we were engaged, and arriving for our first rehearsal, found we were the leading man and leading lady. We took digs together in Bath. I was expecting to be called up at any moment. In fact, I was called up just before the 1939 Christmas show. As I was playing the leading part, this made things very awkward. I pointed this out to the Navy, who were very understanding, saying they would try to manage without me until after the Christmas show. So, after the last performance, in the year 1940, 
I packed away my grease paint and reported for duty. I am ready now. Let battle commence, I said to myself, as I donned my bell-bottoms. I went down to train at Plymouth Barracks. This was a joining routine, consisting of weeks of square bashing, bends and hitches. Here, one day on the parade ground, quite low down, popping in and out of the clouds above our heads, I saw the enemy for the first time, a German plane on reconnaissance. The French, having just surrendered, quite a few big ships from their fleet had nipped across the channel and sought asylum in Plymouth. I volunteered to be a DEMS gunner. DEMS stands for Defensively Equipped Merchant Ship. All merchant ships carried defensive armament, manned by naval ratings. We took a three-week course in Cardiff, many of my contemporaries being Welsh miners, splendid people, and we got on very well indeed. In the fullness of time, I passed the fairly primitive gunnery course, but the first time I pulled the trigger, I got an awful shock. I didn't care for the noise. I was sent to an old merchant ship, the city of Florence. She was a 7,000-ton, two-deck, steel-hulled cargo ship built in 1918. And, to my horror, she was being loaded with projectiles and ammunition to be taken out to Alexandria for the British fleet. A very senior gunner with me was Corporal Young, a pensioner of the Royal Marines, a tiny, pucker little man, who stood to attention all the time and called me lofty because I was so tall. He hated my guts. He was in his fifties, had been brought back for the war, and was forever polishing the brass on his uniform. He was rather a nice chap, really, but he couldn't bear me or the class from which he considered I came. Britain was very much more class-conscious in those days than it is today, and Corporal Young found himself caught between two classes. As a fighting man, he was superior to the merchant navy crew and found himself mixing with its officer class. Although I was junior to him on the gun and just an acting able seaman who didn't know anything about the sea, I was of the officer class. This was all very confusing and frustrating to an experienced Royal Marine who loved the sea and was happy to find himself in uniform again. We shared a cabin in our little deck house, my bunk on the port side, his on the starboard side, and he completely ignored me. This went on for ten months and was an awful strain. The only time he spoke to me was to give orders on the gun, or occasionally when we got drunk together. Then everything would change, and we became the best of friends, talking our heads off about life, love, politics, arts, sex, class distinction, and much else. But as soon as we were sober again, the barriers went up, and absolute silence descended. We were like two different people. I think he had a wife, somewhere, but he never mentioned her. The war was hotting up, and there were air raids in Newport. We didn't like air raids at all, sitting as we were on top of all this ammunition. Then we had a fire. Returning from a shore visit, I found the ship had been unloaded of the cargo of shells and fearsome weaponry. Oh, how lovely, I thought, because they'll fill us with nice things like timber and salt. But no. Once the cause of the fire was discovered, all the explosives were put back and we became a sailing minefield again, off to join a convoy of half a dozen ships from the Bristol Channel, then up the Irish Sea to pick up the even bigger convoy off Glasgow and put out into the Atlantic. At sea on the second night, we were attacked by a wolf pack of U-boats. This was the real thing. No film stars in a tank at Pinewood Studios, but proud ships and the reality of man trying to be brave. The five ships nearest to us went down in five minutes. It was terrifying. 
The corporal and I, and the gun crews we had trained, who were all Indians and Lascars and not awfully good at gunnery, manned the guns. We tried to be brave and train the guns on where we thought the action was, but we couldn't see a thing. The night passed, with the ships in the convoy hooting to each other and trampling on each other's backsides, trying to get out of the way. We stood down at daybreak and were alone. There was not another ship in sight. What was left of the convoy had either dispersed or been sunk. I was frightened that night, the second night out, and almost my last. That was when I grew up. A shell had been left in the gun from the night's work, but, as the captain was afraid of detection, we were forced to continue a course to Durban with a shell up the spout. We managed to conceal from the Durban authorities that the gun was loaded, and it wasn't until we sailed into the Indian Ocean that we were finally allowed to fire it. The long lanyard was pulled, the gun went off, and the stern post fell out of the ship. Eventually, arriving in Alexandria, we thankfully delivered a dangerous cargo. It was the time of Field Marshal Wavell's first push in North Africa, and the British Army were taking Italian prisoners, not by the hundred, but by the thousand. The city of Florence, and any other empty vessels in the vicinity, were commandeered by the authorities to sail along the North African coast and pick up as many of these Italian prisoners as they could. The Florence was only an old 7,000-ton merchant ship, but we picked up literally hundreds of these prisoners from Solum. They came out to us in lighters during the day and were loaded into the ship. We couldn't stay in Solum Harbour overnight and risk being bombed, so in the evening, to avoid being a sitting target, we sailed out into the Mediterranean and steamed around all night. We would repeat this performance the next day, filling up with more prisoners, until we had as many as we could hold, then we took them to Alexandria. Many of the prisoners were only too delighted to escape the war, but conditions were rugged. They were squashed in the hold and only periodically allowed up on deck, in groups, to get some fresh air. They longed for cigarettes, and as we could get these cheaply, the corporal and I bought tins of woodbines, cut the cigarettes in half, and distributed them amongst the clamouring prisoners. In return, they pressed us to take the pictures of the saints from their prayer books. They were a friendly bunch, and there was no trouble, which was remarkable given the appalling conditions. Luckily, it was only a short trip from Solom to Alexandria, where they were put ashore and sent off to prison camps. Having safely transported the last prisoner, the old city of Florence was returned to the shipping company, the city line. Our first trip was to Colombo and then across the Indian Ocean to Rangoon, on the road to Mandalay, where the flying fishes play. There was a desperate gaiety about our runs ashore. Rangoon was wonderful. I was lucky enough to be able to go and stay with some friends of friends who treated me like a king. They were very much the last of the British Raj, enjoying a very unwarlike lifestyle with beautiful food, tennis parties, servants padding about opening curtains and bringing early morning tea in a silver pot. With war raging round the rest of the world, it felt rather immoral. But, oh, the relief of it all. It was a fascinating time. I did nothing very gay and exciting, but enjoyed wandering about, getting the smell of Burma, seeing the Shwedagon pagoda, going to the cathedral, where my parents had been married, and finding their signatures in the register. After two indulgent weeks, it was back to the bell-bottom trousers and on board the dirty old city of Florence. Loaded up with fresh and, this time, less dangerous cargo, we set off homewards, looking for the shark that never came. It was not long after this that the Japanese joined the war, and my friend's scented lifestyle changed. Tracking through the jungle, they had a terrible time getting out of Burma, 
and they had to leave their beautiful things behind, but they survived. I had this enormous hook under my bunk. It had taken me time and trouble to forge, lovingly, out of a butcher's meat hook, and it had a length of sounding wire attached, what a fly fisherman might call a leader. The city of Florence not being the newest vessel that ever plied the seas, we were always breaking down. One Sunday, in the Indian Ocean, homeward bound between Rangoon and Durban, the engines came to a cranking stop. It was midday and equatorially hot. I was sunning myself in a deck chair when a shout went up, Michael, a shark, a shark! I ran to the rail and saw a shark nosing up against the ship. Dashing back to my bunk, picking up my beautiful hook, which had been ready for six months, I called in at the galley for a chunk of raw meat. Impaling it on the hook, I ran up on deck and chucked it at the shark, the crew leaning over the rail to cheer and give advice. The shark abandoned his exploration, turned on his back, and took the bait like a trout taking a mayfly. I heaved on my primitive tackle, but he turned over again, spat the bait back, and disappeared. A shout from the other side of the ship told me the shark had either gone round or underneath, and had popped up on the starboard side. Again I threw the hook and bait, and this time he took it properly. Turning my back until I judged the bait taken, I gave the line a heave, and battle was joined. There was an almighty tussle as the shark threshed about wildly, and I grimly remained connected to the other end, playing it, so to speak. The trouble in the engine room now repaired, the captain wanted to get under way, but sportingly gave me five minutes to get the shark aboard. One of the brave Indian crew, going down the ladder over the side, managed to get a noose round the creature's tail, and we heaved it aboard. The crew descended upon it, bashing it over the head, and then, as happens in the best sailing ship stories, slitting it open to see if there were any gold rings and treasure in the guts. Alas, nothing. I extracted the rows of terrifying teeth with the idea that they would make a necklace for Eve. But the smell, weeks later, when they were handed over to their recipients in England, was awful. Eve was less than thrilled. I took the backbone out and pegged it on top of the deck house to cure it in the sun, thinking to make of it a splendid walking stick. But that didn't materialize either, and we didn't eat it, so the poor shark came to a useless end. After this wonderfully peaceful trip across the Indian Ocean, we picked up the convoy at Durban to come home. As this was a silent convoy, not allowed radio communication, we had to signal by semaphore and oldest lamps. Very slowly, terribly slowly, at the speed of the slowest ship, this huge convoy came zigzagging back to England. Coming ashore at Tilbury, I reported to Naval Command, who seemed to be of the opinion that I should take a commission. Although I had proudly worn my naval uniform for the best part of a year, I had no real understanding of anything nautical, and when asked by an officer to box the compass, I hadn't the faintest idea what he meant. Despite this deficiency, I was judged to be, if not an instant officer, then officer material, and sent down to Brighton, where an officer training establishment had been set up in the King Alfred Baths. Here I learnt the mysteries of compass boxing, and spent a good deal of time crunching all night on Brighton Beach doing sentry duty. Then I went on to Lansing College, where we were polished off and turned into officers, and sometimes gentlemen. We learned how to sit in front of a desk and how to navigate an old naval tender around New Haven, giving the right orders to the wheel. Amazingly, I passed out top of my division. They must have been a rum lot. About this time, radar was coming into service in the Navy. The technicalities of radar baffled me, and watching the scan and pressing buttons confused me greatly, 
but the information received was invaluable. The ranges and bearing were used for targeting, gunnery, submarines and torpedoes, and for directing aircraft. It was suggested that this would be excellent work for me, with my strong actor's voice, so I was one of the first naval officers to be trained in the use of radar for directing fighter aircraft. We had three weeks training at Yeovilton Air Station, where we learnt the rudiments of radar, talking on the radio telephone in plain language to the pilots and giving them courses to intercept the enemy. So, in the spring of 1942, after this intense training, I was posted as fighter direction officer to one of the greatest ships in the British Navy, a ship in which I was to serve for the next two and a half years, HMS Illustrious. Anybody who knows anything about the British Navy over the last 50 years knows about Illustrious. She was a great aircraft carrier and a magnificent ship, not dissimilar in appearance from the new National Theatre building. Because of someone's misplaced faith in me, I was lucky enough to find myself serving in this great ship, second in command to a very good chap called David Pollock, who was an R.N.R. two and a half, Lieutenant Commander. Unfortunately, he was not to be on board for very long. After sailing out of Liverpool and carrying out an operation on Madagascar, he transferred to a desk job at the Admiralty, and I was left as the only trained fighter direction officer in the Eastern Fleet. My rank was upped immediately to Lieutenant Commander, and there I stayed for another two years, serving under three or four captains and several admirals. What were you in peacetime, Holden? An actor, sir. Right. You're in charge of entertainments. Though I felt daunted by the whole thing, I nevertheless began to appreciate that an aircraft carrier is an excellent ship in which to have any kind of theatrical entertainment. There was an enormous space under the flight deck, and the huge aircraft lifts, when raised, made a splendid stage. There was a lot of real talent around. Illustrious carried a Royal Marine Band, and with the bandmaster conducting from the fine orchestra pit we had constructed, they made a splendid noise that raised everyone's spirits. We were lucky enough to have aboard Robert Edison, a witty man with a lively imagination and a very good actor, who featured with me in several sketches full of terrible jokes and badinage, much appreciated by the ship's company. At some point, Admiral Mountbatten had been captain of Illustrious. I met him once in Colombo, when he was commander-in-chief of the Eastern Fleet. He came on board, inspected us, and came round to my fighter direction position, where I delivered him a short lecture on the mysteries of our communications. He must have been very properly impressed, as none of the high-ranking officers knew anything about it. He was a handsome figure of a man, standing there in his tropical gear, but I thought he had suspicious hips. It was about this time that not only had I formed a deep and lasting attachment to Illustrious, but I had also formed a deep and lasting attachment to Eve Mortimer, the young actress I had met four years before at Bristol Rep. The ship was in Liverpool having a refit. Eve was working at Southport Rep nearby, which had opened again, and as I had a fortnight's leave... It seemed the perfect opportunity to get married. So, on the 27th of April, 1943, with dear Canon Hudson officiating and Cyril Luckham, my best man, Eve and I were married. Eve's mother was not able to come to the wedding. She was a Christian scientist, and refusing treatment for an illness was confined to her room. We called to see her after the wedding, had a glass of wine together, and then joined illustrious where a splendid reception had been prepared in the wardroom. The ship's officers and the captain drank our health. We had planned to spend our wedding night in the Adelphi in Liverpool, but as there was some delay with the car that had been sent to fetch us, the captain kindly offered his magnificent cabin for our first dinner together as man and wife. 
diplomatically getting himself invited down to the wardroom for his dinner. Eve and I were left alone, looking at each other across the captain's table, in this magnificent cabin, which had been redecorated and furnished by Admiral Mountbatten when he had been in command of the ship. We spent some of our honeymoon, on a fishing holiday, of course, at Mount Turog in Wales. I don't remember a great deal about the fishing. I've had a lot of affairs during my life. I've enjoyed the female body, but I really don't know what it is to be passionately in love. I loved Eve as much as, if not more than, I've ever loved anyone. Even so, I remember sitting on the train from Liverpool to Mount Turog the morning after we were married, looking across the carriage at Eve and wondering if I had done the right thing. Here we were, married for life. I found the whole idea rather daunting and wondered how common that feeling was. I still do. After our honeymoon, I went back to Illustrious and shortly after sailed away, leaving my bride with a moist handkerchief and a brave smile, ready to go back to her work in Southport Rep. When Germany was defeated in 1945, Fighter Direction, the little private navy of which I was one of the first twelve members, had expanded to several hundred. And after serving in Illustrious for two and a half years, I found myself in the Admiralty. I was in the department of the Naval Assistant to the Second Sea Lord, and in the powerful position of being able to appoint other fighter direction officers. Eve and I had taken a rather grand flat in Elverston Place in Kensington, and I was enjoying my new desk job. I smoked a lot, telephoned a lot, and drank a good deal of gin. I wasn't particularly brilliant at the actual deskery of it, but I suppose I wasn't too bad, and it kept me in touch with all the bleed-in officers all the bleed-in time. Quite a few actors were employed in the fighter direction, as we were expected to be good at radio telephoning, speaking into microphones and that sort of thing. One of the officers for whom I was responsible was fellow actor Kenny Moore, who had passed out of Yeovilton with flying colours as an FDO. His career in films looked very promising, and as the war in Europe had ended and he didn't want to be stuck out in the Pacific, he pleaded with me to find him a job at home. So good was he at his job that I had no choice but to send him out to the Far East. He was rather cross about that, but soon after came back, and all was well. He made a very successful career, generously forgiving me and bearing me no malice. We've laughed about it since. After four years of being kindly looked after by the Navy, I realised I was going to have to make my own living. Getting back to my profession became the object and preoccupation of the day. Civvy Street loomed. That's the end of...